Hi, this is Jay Warner Wallace. If you're a fan of clear thinking and of being able to make the case for what you believe as a Christian, to be able to make the case for truth, well, this is a great place to learn how to do that. This is Deeper Waters with Nick Peters. Nick has a number of great guests on his show, and I've been just honored to be one of those guests. So if you want to carve some time to be able to become a better Christian case maker, this is the way to do it, right here at Deeper Waters with Nick Peters. You stand on the shore of the ocean watching the tide come in. You sense the call of the sea beckoning to take you further. You step forward little by little, not knowing what to expect, but expecting more. You keep going as the ocean calls, calls you to enter in to deeper waters. everyone, welcome to the Deeper Waters Podcast. I'm Nick Peters, your host, seeking to bring you the very best in Christian scholarship and apologetics, and today is no exception. I'd like to say something right at the start. Um, if you're listening to these shows now, the most recent ones are just now being uploaded, and in those episodes, I asked if anyone has any capabilities of audio to help out and such, where just... Wednesday, I think, was someone just messaged me listening to one of my old shows that, hey, you know, if you ever need any help with audio, let me know. So, thankfully, we have that fulfilled. So, I appreciate if anyone out there would have been willing, but we do have it. But if you want to help out somehow, I'm sure we could find something. But today, uh, we're talking about Mormonism. And this is going to be done a bit interesting because we're going to have one guest for first hour and another guest for second hour. We've never done that before, but somehow we are going to pull it off here. Now, if you drive around your town here, especially if you live here in the Western America, you'll see churches of many denominations. Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Lutherans. We could go on and on. Every now and then, you'll probably see a church that says the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as Mormons. Is that a church just like all the other churches? You know, we've got a few minor differences in doctrine and such, but overall, we all believe the same things. Or is it something very different? Where well, today I'm talking about a book called Leaving Mormonism, Why Four Scholars Change Their Minds and What They Think About Mormonism. And two of the two editors are going to be on, and that's uh, Corey Miller, who's making his first appearance on here, and Lynn Wilder, who's been on here before. But first off, we have Corey here. He is a PhD, President and CEO of Ratio Christi, Campus Apologetics Alliance. He currently teaches philosophy and comparative religions at Indiana University Kokomo and has taught at Purdue U, Multnomah University, and Ecola Bible College. He possesses graduate degrees in Biblical Studies, Multnomah Biblical Seminary, Philosophy of Religion and Ethics, Biola Talbert School of Theology, and Philosophy, Purdue U, as well as a doctorate in Philosophical Theology from the University of Aberdeen, Scotland. He is co-editor of Is Faith in God Reasonable? Debates in Philosophy, Science, and Rhetoric, from Rutledge 2014, and co-author of Leaving Mormonism, Why Four Scholars Change Their Minds, Ratio Christi, Craig 2017. Dr. Mill, welcome to Deeper Waters Podcast. Hi, Nick. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. If my audience doesn't know who you are, could you tell us a little bit about how you got to be doing what you're doing? Wow, that's a long story. I'll, I'll try to keep that brief. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I came out of Mormonism... Um, I developed an insatiable passion for truth because I needed to be able to sink myself into something, sink my teeth into something that was true. And if I was going to commit my life to it, indeed my eternal life, if there was such a thing after being disenchanted with Mormonism, it better be true. And so I I found a, a passion for comparative religions and philosophy entered into that uh, area, which is where I teach at today at at IU, as you mentioned, 
And then this opportunity came up. I thought I was going to go be a professor somewhere uh, when I went to the Midwest and, and uh, did doctoral studies at Purdue. And I found uh, some uh, elements of hostility amongst the ranks and realized that uh, the university has some serious problems and we really need to be about reclaiming the voice of Christ in the university. And so an opportunity came up with Rocio Christie for this position and I felt like uh, it was a good fit, hand in glove, and here I am, ready to uh, try to engage uh, the life of the mind on the university campuses to reclaim the most influential institution of Western civilization. Uh, tell us a little bit also about Ratio Christie, in case people don't know about it. Yeah, so Ratio Christie uh, Campus Apologetics Alliance is the subtitle. It means the reason of Christ. We are not simply about theism, but we are Christocentric in our approach. And uh, we are on campus. That's what separates us from other apologetics ministries. And uh, we do apologetics. Um, and that's what separates us from other campus ministries. Mm. And then our very DNA is to forge alliances. We do. We believe we can do things bigger and better together. So it's a big task uh, to reclaim the universities that were once started by Christians, uh, the very foundation of it, the inception of it, uh, the unity and diversity forming the university uh emerged in, in Christian medieval Europe for a very good reason. And so that's what we're about. Uh, our mission is to, uh, as a global movement, to equip students and faculty with historical, philosophical, and scientific reasons for following Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk about you being involved in Mormonism, were you born into Mormonism or did you have Mormons come knocking at your door and you joined Mormonism that way? I was born into it. I'm mm -hmm. a genealogical Mormon in mm -hmm. the sense that, uh, in contrast to my uh, co-editor that you'll talk with shortly, uh, she was a convert into it. I was born into it, uh, sixth-generation Mormon, Brigham Young's, or sorry, Joseph Smith's uh, great, great, uh, sorry, uh, distracted here for the moment, uh, my great, great great grandfather was Joseph Smith's bodyguard. And so that's what I knew. That's what I grew up with in Utah. Uh, wasn't really aware there was much else. Uh, the demographics have changed a lot in the state, but that was my life. And it wasn't just traditional. I actually did believe it, contrary to what some detractors might say uh, and try to undercut what I'm doing now. Uh, saying that I wasn't really Mormon. No, I, I really was. When I was supposed to be baptized at age eight, I didn't get baptized. The reason I didn't is because I think I was more sincere even than others. I knew that in order to get to celestial heaven, I had to have a clean slate. But baptism will clean that slate and only do it once. And so I knew that uh there has to be a different way. And so I thought, well, I'm going to wait till I'm 88 years old on my deathbed, get baptized then and beat the system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I lived in fear for the whole next year thinking, what if something terrible happens? What if I get hit by a semi truck and I failed to be baptized by the proper priestly authorities like I should have and knew that I should have? Uh, and so I finally capitulated at age nine and I got baptized. Mm -hmm. But there's this, you know, this struggle in Mormonism between uh, this uh, mission impossible of becoming perfect, perfect by this lifetime or try, try your best and God will make up the rest. And as a young boy, I knew that tension. I felt that tension. And so uh, I while I was a genealogical Mormon, I chose to be a Mormon. You know, I haven't got to read it yet, but I'm thinking about, um, I can't remember his name, I just had a blank, but Spencer or someone who wrote The Miracle of Forgiveness. Spencer uh, W. Kimball. Spencer Kimball, that's it. And I haven't got to read it yet, but from what I've heard about that book, The Miracle of Forgiveness make it seem like it's a miracle that anyone would get forgiven in Mormonism. 
Right. Uh, and that is the great miracle, you know, for a man who is an apostle for 20 years and a prophet for 10 more, possessing the combined authority of uh, a prophet like Moses and an apostle mm-hmm. like Paul, he decides that he's going to write one major piece to leave as his legacy after he dies. And it uh-huh. was this issue, the gospel, how to get your sins forgiven. And in that book, he teaches that you must become perfect by this lifetime or else. And he says, trying is not sufficient. Mm-hmm. It's curious that they've uh, stopped printing it. Mm. Now, I, I said from the start that we drive around, we see all these churches in our area and such. Isn't Mormonism just another denomination? I mean, X is Baptist, Y is Methodist, Z is Lutheran. Sure, they have some doctrinal disagreements. They all believe the same thing. Isn't Mormonism just another one? That seems to be what a lot of Christians think, and probably mm-hmm. the reason why the Mormon missionaries boast an average Baptist church per week gets converted by them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, Webster's Dictionary talks about uh, a Christian being someone who believes in Christ, and of course they have Christ mm-hmm. all over their name tags, all over their church. Mm-hmm. They like to say that every 1.7 verses, Christ or his ministry is mentioned in the Book of Mormon. but You know, Nick, you and I both have a mom, Mm -hmm. and you can spell it backwards and forwards, and I can too, and we spell it the same way. Perhaps we have the same mom. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, to get down to the bottom of that, we don't look at just the term mom. We start to describe the characteristics of that mom, and and eventually we realize, okay, we've got different moms. Uh Just because you spell it J-E-S-U-S doesn't mean it's the same Jesus, Uh, The Mormon Jesus is vastly different from the Christian Jesus. Mm -hmm. The Mormon concept of God uh, is so different, infinitely different, that when uh, I teach comparative religions at uh, Indiana University, sometimes I'll have to teach Western religions, other times Eastern, and I'll have to determine where to teach Mormonism, and oftentimes I teach it under Hinduism, even Mm -hmm. though it claims to be the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, because it's Theology is much closer to uh, the number of gods in Hinduism or the Greco-Roman concept of God. Uh, their, their view of God has more in common with the uh, listening device that listeners are, are hearing from right now in terms of it being finite than it has in common with God. Um, it's Their God is a creation. Jesus was um, humanized divinity— and then progress to becoming divinized humanity. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some people I understand, they say, if you looked at the Book of Mormon, there are some places where it can be a bit off and such, but sometimes the theology is more conservative in such many places. It's when you get into later revelations, like the doctrines and covenants and such, that you get the very bizarre stuff. Right, right. Yeah, the Book of Mormon... um, you know, when, when Joseph Smith died, he did not have a replacement policy. And eventually there were over 400 different sects of Mormonism emerged over the last uh, 170, 80 years. Uh, some of them don't believe all of this new revelation. They certainly don't believe in the new uh, uh, prophet, uh Russell mm-hmm. Nelson, who just became appointed as the prophet. I understand, because, for instance, Emma Smith, Joseph's wife, quickly dropped polygamy f- when she formed her denomination. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for good reason. Um, she had uh, dozens to compete with. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the Book of Mormon uh, doesn't teach three degrees of glory. It doesn't mm-hmm. teach, uh, you know, three different levels of heaven. It doesn't teach... Uh, polygamy. It doesn't teach polytheism. And so uh, it's, a, it's a lot more orthodox in certain respects, even if it's not a historical book, really. Yeah. Now, what is it then that gets someone from being a sixth generation Mormon to being the president of Ratio Christi arguing against Mormonism? What, ca- what was the thing that got you thinking? Okay, maybe this isn't true. 
Well, a lot of Mormons think that what gets me doing this is my hatred uh, for Mormons or for Mormonism. That's Mm -hmm. usually what they'll say, that this is just anti-Mormon literature or anti-Mormon conversation points, uh, that I'm angry, you know, the ex-Mormons are just angry and bitter. No, actually, uh, those people have become atheists. Approximately 47 to 53 percent of people who are leaving Mormonism now in the Mormon exodus are finding a solstice in in, um, the new atheism or agnosticism. What separates me and the authors of my book is that we actually still cling to Jesus more than ever uh, in in a deeper way than we ever did before, and that we love Mormons. And so, as I say in the first uh, couple paragraphs in the book, part of me did not want to write this book. I, I still have Mormon family members, and at a time when religion is being um, attacked like never before in this country, we need to find alliances where we can. Nonetheless, while Mormons can be good friends and make good citizens, and they, they do, um, and they're productive members of society for the most part— uh, Mormonism is false, and its doctrines uh, are not Christian, and it will lead people to hell. And so out of love, we have to be able to speak up. And what, what made me originally, though, uh, Nick, mm-hmm. uh, leave was not leaving their theology. It was, in my particular case, I left the sociology. I left the community of a lot of the people that I knew that I felt well, were very hypocritical. And uh, yeah, my mom was a smoker. That's a definite no-no in Mormonism. It's uh, against the words of wisdom. Uh, it'll certainly keep you out of the celestial kingdom. And, you know, I didn't really feel like I was treated well. I felt like I was ostracized, that, you know, I didn't grow up with a father figure. Uh, my extended family were very, very... Uh, Mormon, but my immediate family, mom and dad, were both sort of black sheep of their family. And whether that was, uh, you know, the fault of Mormonism or not, I don't think so. I think it was just those individuals. Uh, I pulled away from the community, but not away from Mormonism. I still believed in the theology. I still believed in God. Uh, I figured I just didn't need to belong to that particular community. And so there is a sense in which, you know, to be totally honest, I— uh, I left the community, but not the theology, until I got invited to go to a non-denominational Christian camp in California. And it wasn't about going to the camp. It was about spending the summer at the beaches. And the precondition from my friend's father, who lived there, was that I had to go to this camp. Uh, His son and myself had to go to this camp. He would pay for it. And when I got there, the speaker spoke on hell, and I tell people that scared the hell out of me and heaven into me, literally. Mm-hmm. It so rocked my world. Uh, I'd never really heard about hell much in Mormonism, and I never saw the gospel in the light that I did there. Uh, grace is not the same thing in Mormonism as it is in Christianity. And I saw my need for grace when I realized I was a sinner, uh, much worse than I'd ever considered. And that drew me in, and then I saw the love of Christ in people for the first time, and that was the other side of the coin that I identified the community of Christ right there. So I went home, packed my bags, and moved to California for my junior year of high school, where I was discipled by uh, this pastor and this Christian family, and uh, came back to Utah the next year, and that's when things started to get difficult, and I really had to start pouring into philosophy and comparative religions and science, things that I had no interest in before. Yeah, I think I remember reading in your book about what got you to go to this trip and such. It wasn't, I want to learn about Jesus and such. It was for women, wasn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I thought that there would be some cute girls there, to be sure, so it wouldn't be a waste of my time. Yeah, but I really wanted to spend the summer at the beaches, and uh, this was the precondition to be able to do so. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said that... uh, in your book also, right, you want to make sure something was true before you latched onto it again. And I think this is something a lot of Christians can miss when we're talking to Mormons, is that we go after how wrong Mormonism is, and we can go and show that, but then the Mormon doesn't say, ah, Mormonism is false, I'm going straight to Jesus. Mm-hmm. No, a lot of times they go to agnosticism and atheism. Right. 
Yes. Uh, and that wasn't the case in the past. They mm-hmm. used to, you know, just go off in some corner and uh, feel betrayed and mm-hmm. feel angry, but there was nowhere to go. Mm-hmm. Since 2001, uh, with the arrival of 9-11 and uh, this rage against religion because the new atheism emerged and started blaming every evil activity uh, that Islam had done on Christianity and started, you know, finding new holes to poke in the Bible and things like that. And this this vitriol toward religion had begun in a new way. Uh, Mormons that leave Mormonism now not only have already grown up believing, as the Eighth Article of Faith says, we believe the Bible as far as it's translated correctly, which Mm -hmm. implies that it's got problems. So that's not a problem, though, as long as you've got living prophets and the priesthood authority. But once you realize that's all false, you've already believed the Bible's got problems. Now you not only believe that the Bible's got problems, and so the the primary way of that we tend to take authoritative knowledge of God— uh, from the text, but you're mad at religion. You feel betrayed, and you want to do something about it. And now there is a community of people that are glad to embrace you and assimilate you and con- conscript you for their cause. And so that's happening, maybe in record numbers right now. Mm. You know, I, with the rise of the internet, I think that in in addition has helped that. Yeah, you know, I I also tell people when. Your dialogue with Mormons, I don't think it's best to attack Mormonism so much as it is to build up the Bible. And if the Bible is shown to be true, and things in Mormonism contradict the Bible, then that's going to put the Mormon in a more difficult position. Yeah, um, uh, I guess I want to step back a little bit and say agreed, but caveat. Mm -hmm. The Greek philosopher Epictetus said that we have two ears and one mouth for a reason, Mm -hmm. so that we listen more. And I think that our evangelism efforts, our apologetic efforts, when we talk with people, uh, need to take time to listen and Mm -hmm. figure out what is that individual person objecting to, or what's what are they passionate about? Why are mm-hmm. they still a Mormon, mm-hmm. uh, or why are they not? I need to be able to listen to them, because you get five different Mormons, you get six different opinions. They're all over mm-hmm. the map. And many Mormons aren't really concerned about the logic or theology, the logos about the theos, the, mm-hmm. the thinking about God. It's more driven by sociology and psychology. Uh, it's a very pragmatic religion. Uh, it works for them, and that's good enough. They've got good family values. Some have said, I don't care what you show me. Even if you show me that Joseph Smith is a false prophet, I will not believe it because I have a testimony. I know the church is true. Mm -hmm. So you really have to, I think, listen. um, And some people just need a hug. Other people need an argument, and sometimes that argument needs to be a defense of the Christian position, the Bible, or Christian uh, thought on some matter, or maybe it's going to be polemical. Maybe it has to be undermining uh, something they take to be authoritative, whether that is the text, the Book of Mormon, uh, revelations of Joseph Smith, or even the individual Mormon testimony, as they call it, which is the the be-all, end-all buck stopper for the average Mormon. Yeah, I kind of have this idea that when I'm dialoguing with Mormons and they jump straight to that testimony every time, I consider <laughs> yeah. it kind of like as a gamer person. I say, okay, if I'm fighting a boss, I've just hit their weak point right here because they're going into their defensive testimony. Yeah, yeah. I just uh, had an article published in December in the Christian Research Journal on the use and misuse of testimony in our dialogue with Mormons. And oftentimes the the testimony is delivered with such expressive tenacity that one might be tempted to conflate it with veracity. Uh, It's so persuasive and passionate sounding that some people get captured by it and and mistake it for truth. Mm -hmm. And the Mormon himself or herself mistakes it for truth. I mean, you're told to bear testimony at testimony testimony meetings 
monthly growing up so that, you know, when you've said it a thousand times, you end up believing it. And most Mormon testimonies sound the same. They're not like uh, you know, the Christian testimony about how Christ changed our life or mm. maybe a testimony about what God is doing in my life right now. The, uh, the typical testimony has basic parts to it, like I know Joseph Smith's a prophet of God, I know the Book of Mormon is the Word of God, and I know that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the one true church. I bear you my testimony, and you can know it too if you just pray about it and receive what Dolan Oaks, a Mormon apostle, called a burning in the bosom. And so it's a very spiritualized epistemology or theory of knowledge that they're operating under. Um, and I want to be careful at this because a lot of Christians just immediately dismiss it. Um, but we have testimonies, too, and Scripture has things to say about testimony. And and testimony has uh, very uh, well-grounded philosophical roots as well, uh, testimonial knowledge. Um, in epistemology. The problem is that their testimony becomes the sole criterion for truth. And I tell people this, that you should really stick to the essentials with, with Mormons. Who is God? How does man get to heaven? Both of which find their segue in the person and work of Christ. Don't worry about, you know, caffeine questions or occultic symbols on the Mormon temple or whatever. Those are all interesting, but they're, they're not essentials. You've got to get to the essentials anyway. Mm -hmm. But even though the testimony is not an essential doctrine on which your soul rides uh, to have the right God on the right terms of agreement by grace through faith, um, it is an essential doctrine in the conversation, because every time, as you noted, Nick, mm -hmm. they're going to come back to their testimony. They're going to sit deeply into that thing, dig their heels in, mm -hmm. and nothing you say is going to matter. So somehow we've got to be able to, as I say in that article, make room for doubt before we can make room for faith, uh, reasonable faith. Um, and that is by uh, giving them a, a wake up shot to an over-reliance on their testimony. Mm. One way of doing that is by bearing our own testimony. We should be doing that because that speaks Mormonese, Mormon language, and it's powerful to them. But we should show them that, look, how many different sects of Mormonism are there anyway? Most of them won't know there's been 400, but they'll be able to name two or three or four. And so you can use the illustration like a police lineup that, you know, they all come into the room and they're all trying to get you to join their sect. Which one do you join? They all bear their testimony. Sounds identical. I, I one at a time. And at the end of the day, how are you to determine which one is true? At best, only one of those can be true because they're contradictory. At worst, they're contraries and they're all false. But what that shows is that the Mormon who's talking with you can now see that um, that a testimony that's ultimately so subjective could be deceptive. They have to say that Emma, her denomination, and Joseph Smith's son that went and started what was the RLDS church in Missouri, they have to say that those people are either lying and judge their hearts, which people don't want to judge people today, or they're going to have to say that they're deceived. So they can be deceived by a testimony, a testimony that says the Book of Mormon is true and that Joseph Smith's a prophet of God and that my version of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the one true church. They can be deceived by praying that prayer at the end of the Book of Mormon. Yes. Well, then how do you know you're not deceived? Mm. You know, I, I think people don't realize how much Mormonism has control over the minds of its followers. When I lived in Charlotte, my, my roommate was a good friend of mine, still is David Sorrell. And, uh, oh, yes. I yep, know David. Yep, great guy. And he and I would often have uh, Mormons come by. Joe was witnesses too, but we usually, whenever we have people come by, we also. Uh, would order a pizza from Little Caesars and pick it up and have drinks there, like Gatorade and such, that we could all have a meal together while we talked and such. Because we thought, this is something they'll really appreciate. But we're talking to them, and one of them has this glass of blue Gatorade. 
And he's talking uh-huh. about a prophet. And he says, let me put it this way. If a prophet told me this blue Gatorade was red, I'd believe it. He said that, huh? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's about right. Uh, I, I recall a time similar when I was in the Salt Lake Temple in a visiting center with a missionary. Normally, they do not divide. They have at least two, maybe three, strength mm-hmm. in numbers. And um, I took him through the process that I usually do with missionaries and that mm-hmm. I do in, the, in one of the chapters in my book. Uh, it includes Spencer W. Kimball, but it includes going through the Book of Mormon about <clears throat> what is required and the deadline by w- w- what is required to get your sins forgiven. And at the end, he said, if what you're telling me is true, would I have to leave my church? And I said, if what I'm telling you is true, you would want to leave the church just as I did because it can take you to hell. He said, then I won't do it. I won't turn my back on my family. Mm-hmm. And that was that was the bottom line, right? It's again, yeah. it's pragmatic. It's it's uh, it feels good or it works for me, mm-hmm. so I'm not going to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, something also about the whole thing with the burning in the bosom that I find extremely problematic because I've prayed the prayer before, you know, so I could tell Mormons that I've done it, yeah. And they'll call me and say, So, how did you feel? Felt fine, you know. Now, I think it's not the answer they want to get, but it just seems that part of the problem to me of a test is that if you pray and you get the answer they want, where the test is true, see, it works. If you pray, you don't get the answer, where the problem's you. That exactly. the test is if unfalsifiable. It's, if it's verified, it's true. If it's falsified, the problem is you. Yep. Now, you also call your chapter In Search of a Good Life. Why is that? Well, it's uh, I've got a book that's uh, getting ready to go under contract uh, with that. Uh, it was part of my dissertation looking at Aristotle and Maimonides and Aquinas, uh, really noted authors in the Greek tradition, Judaism, and Christianity. Mm-hmm. And they all had this... Um, uh, this common notion uh, of what the purpose or goal of life is. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because that's what you find beginning with Aristotle is that uh, all men by nature desire to know, to know what, to know ultimate reality. And ultimate reality for Aristotle uh, may not be the same kind of God as the Christian God, but it was theos. Nonetheless, it was God. You can't do Aristotelian philosophy at the end of the day without uh, God as a premise in the argument. And so Aristotle had this um, this understanding of what human nature is in, in its raw form and what the human telos is or purpose or end or goal and that all humans are purpose driven, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the whole universe is uh, purpose driven. It's it's uh, through and through its teleological design. Um, and so there's human nature, the human telos, and then how to get from A to B. And why is it that so many people are not living the good life? And what is the good life for Aristotle? Well, people may define it differently, but everyone is pursuing happiness. And it struck me when I was studying Aristotle that that's what Mormonism is. That's what we told people. That's what the the video says inside the visiting center in the Mormon temple. The purpose to life is to learn to live happily. Mm -hmm. And you read Maimonides, and the end goal is the knowledge of God. And you read uh, Aquinas, and it's that. And Jesus said in red lettering, here then is eternal life, to know God. And happiness in the classic tradition is consonant with holiness. And so the good life um, has a lot of uh, a traditional, well-grounded thought behind it that the perp- that there is an objective purpose to life. Mm-hmm. And the Mormons think that there is this objective purpose, and it is happiness in a Mormon understanding through mm-hmm. the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Well, the problem that I drew out in my dissertation is that those various thinkers had um, uh, fatal uh, obstacles that they couldn't cross over, and, and finally, 
uh, we get to Aquinas that brings us into relief about um, this knowledge of God that's not just through natural observation, a la Aristotle, Mm -hmm. or even external revelation, a la Maimonides and the Torah, but there is actually this Holy Spirit um, indwelling this pneumatic relational epistemology or theory of knowledge that Christians embrace. And I want to embrace as a Christian the uh, a spiritual knowledge. Well, this is Mormonism. Uh, they have the corner on this, they think, about the mm-hmm. The prayer and the burning in the bosom. And so I just thought that my, my research do, dovetailed nicely um, into this conversation. And I really think, you know, this is what we're all striving for. We're all seeking for the good life, for happiness, whatever that is. But it's like that uh, country music song, you're looking for love in all the wrong places. Mm. Same thing. Uh, happiness is not subjective. It is objective. And the way to that happiness is talked about in the Bible, mm-hmm. um, and it's through Jesus Christ. And the Mormons think that they've got it, but they don't. They've got a different Jesus, a different God, a different gospel. And the end for them is not happiness. And so out of love for them, it's incumbent upon us to share with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I like that you point out, though, that there's nothing wrong with seeking a happy life, seeking a good life. That's what we're all supposed to do. That's what God designed us to do, in fact. Right. That's right. Mm. I, yeah. Now, as we keep talking about Mormonism here, and we've talked some about the burning and the bosom and such, and... What are some other things you'd recommend talking with Mormons about to kind of do what Greg Coco says of put a rock in their shoes? Well, I think the I think the testimony is critical uh, up front somewhere. And uh, for listeners. Somewhere in the conversation, first John, chapter five, verses nine through 13 should be shared about Mm -hmm. the testimony, because there Mm -hmm. it uses that term several times. And you want to be able to communicate with your audience. You want to know your audience and their terminology and what makes them tick. And Mm -hmm. the testimony makes them tick. And in that passage, it talks about uh, how the testimony that God has given is essentially that you can know that if you die, you'll go to be with God in heaven. Mm -hmm. Why? Not based on anything I've done, but because he who has the son has the life. Mm-hmm. And that's it. The ones who deny that um, and deny grace, for those whom grace is uh, rejected, grace is eventually denied. And I think uh, it, it says that those who do not believe that testimony of God call God a liar. And so this is a big pebble in the foot, and it gives us an opportunity to share the gospel in that passage with the word testimony and then to bear our testimony. So first you undermine or subvert their overconfidence in theirs by using the police lineup illustration that I shared. And then second, you share your own testimony. Every Christian ought to be able to do that. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to do that. Mm. Um, The other elements are, I think they need to focus on uh, the essentials on uh, salvation and God. And so in, again, uh, one of my chapters, um, I deal with two uh, obstacles on the road to human perfectibility. Similar to Aristotle, similar to Maimonides, there were two levels, mm-hmm. human uh, moral perfection, uh, and then the perfect knowledge, the knowledge of God question. Mm-hmm. And so when it comes to salvation, Um, the Mormons talk about grace. They talk about the gospel. They talk about Jesus. But but even Spencer W. Kimball has gone on record to say that there's almost no greater doctrine in hell than the doctrine that you are saved by grace alone through faith alone. The Book of Mormon says you're saved by grace after all you can do. Mm Mm-hmm. 
That's quite different than what we have. Yeah. Now, I think another aspect that a lot of us don't understand, and I don't think we can, someone like you can more better understand growing up in Mormonism, is just how when you grow up as a Mormon, your whole life is Mormonism. So when you ask someone to leave Mormonism, you're not asking them to just to change a denomination or such. You ask them to change their entire identity. Right. And you don't, you know, you generally don't find situations uh, as bad as, say, in Islam with honor killing mm-hmm. right. <laughs> uh, or even in some areas uh, in Orthodox Judaism in, in Jerusalem. Um, but you do find ostracization. Uh, I've had friends whose grandparents had refused to call them by their first name and instead uh, called them apostate. Mm. Um, it's a pejorative term. It's a disassociation, uh, a sort of you are dead to me. You know, you do not, uh, you can face tremendous shunning in the Mormon community. Uh, some are insulated from that. In my case, uh, again, because my immediate family situation was not the ideal, they were not the, what we would call in Utah vernacular, the Molly Mormon, mm. um, they were. She was more of a Jack Mormon. Mm. Uh, the equivalency in our terminology would be on fire Christian or lukewarm Christian. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but for many, many of them, that's why the average Christian in in uh, sharing Christ with a Mormon, they've got to realize that even if the Mormon in their mind is starting to hear what the Christian is saying, and they're contemplating a possible, mm-hmm. what would it be like if I if I departed? They're struck with a radical life change. I mean, if, if I go to a Mormon church in Indiana where I'm at today, and then I decide to go in North Carolina or in California, they're all going to look the same on the outside and in the inside. They're very familiar. Mm-hmm. The, um, they don't have sermons, but the sacrament meetings, they're all going to be the same. They're going to be covering the same content and so forth. Wherever you go, you've got this community. What are they supposed to do? Go to the Methodist church downtown? Uh, go to the Holy Roller Pentecostal church? Uh, they don't know anyone. It's so different. Um, and why would they trade in this great community for something so unfamiliar and sometimes for them that might seem subpar. Mm-hmm. So the other thing that we've got to consider is making sure that we love the Mormon, not just giving them truth. Um, you can you can tell the truth without loving someone, but you cannot love them without telling them the truth. Mm-hmm. And we do need to love them, and they need to be able to see an alternate community. That's what did it for me. When I when I heard about hell, it first scared the hell out of me, and I realized I was a sinner worthy of death. But I also saw this community, uh, that Christ was manifest, and it gave me confidence that that's, that's, that's the life right there. Mm-hmm. I, I can see associating with those people. It made a big difference. Mm-hmm. Now, something you said I would like to ask a little bit about. You said about uh, these people moved to a new community. Where are they going to go? And I mean, why would they go to the Methodist church and such? And that could be difficult for a lot of us to understand because my wife and I have had to move twice to different cities. And that means finding a different church. And yet we don't know anyone really at a lot of these churches that we go to, but we wind up going for me anyway, and after a while we just fit in. I mean, what makes it different from a Mormon? Why can a Mormon just do that? Well, every ward, that's the group that they're assigned inside of the, the stake, uh, that mm-hmm. particular church, they're all the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're not accustomed to such diversity out there, and they're not sure which one to join. In one sense, they come back to what's called the Grove experience, when Joseph Smith didn't know which church to join, according to his story. Mm -hmm. And every different church wanted him to join them. And he went into the the forest to pray and prayed this very sincere prayer, as it goes. And God says, don't join any of them. All their creeds are an abomination. 
So one, they've already learned all their creeds are an abomination. Two, mm-hmm. that the Bible is not uh, trustworthy. And then three, well, which one am I going to do? That the whole the whole premise, uh, you know, when, when you th- consider Mormonism, th- it's built built on two necessary and jointly sufficient conditions. Number mm-hmm. one, there's a total apostasy, a total falling away, and then number two, there's a restoration of the, of the priestly authority. Mm-hmm. And so, um, missionary discussion number one, when the missionaries come to your home, is to sell you on that issue. That look out there, uh, Mister Peters. Look, mm-hmm. look how many different variations there are. Certainly, there's no God there. Uh, which which one do you go to? Which, what did God do? They would say, Mister Peters, in the Old Testament, when there were so many different menus of options to choose from in religions. How did he get his story straight and secure? Well, through Mm -hmm. the prophets. That's right, Mr. Peters. What about in the New Testament? How did he do it then with all the Greco-Roman gods? Oh, uh, through apostles. That's right, Mr. Peters. And how about now? Uh, That's a good question. Well, Mr. Peters, do you know of any church that has a living apostle and prophets? Uh, Oh, your church. You said your church, right? That's right, Mr. Peters. So they they already have built this premise from the beginning, built their foundation on this premise that the diversity counts against those churches. Um, and so you just don't know which one to go to. And so it really takes a Christian coming alongside a Mormon. Mm-hmm. And um, the other thing, to, just to add a fourth point to that is they feel intensely betrayed by church. Mm-hmm. Tithing, a Utah Utah pastors struggle to talk about tithing, church attendance, and authority, mm-hmm. because half their congregation are ex Mormon, mm. and they they've been there, done that, got the T shirt, and they say no, thank you. Mm-hmm. I think another thing that could set Christians up for a, a Mormon claim to come to them is too many Christians do rely on emotions and feelings as a way of what they think God is telling them they need to do. And if Mormonism can provide that, we'll be ready to go right through the door. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, there was, uh, I was a youth pastor before in the Northwest and I remember uh, someone coming to my church who brought six kids. Uh, Mm -hmm. He homeschooled, his wife homeschooled six kids He had just finished his THM, a four-year master's degree in theology from Princeton Theological Seminary. Mm -hmm. And he was doubting. Why was he doubting? Because he ran into Mormon missionaries. What? A THM from Princeton Theological Seminary. Well, you've got some issues with Princeton, granted. But a THM from Princeton. What was it that got him? It was that he met with some Mormon missionaries, and they bore their testimony with such tenacity. I thought, how could they know that with that much certitude? I don't know that. I wish I did. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Maybe there's a problem here. And he began to doubt, and it became the unraveling of his faith. Mm -hmm. Because he talked to a 19-year-old Mormon missionary. So it is quite powerful and the Mormons, in their writing, uh, their leaders tell them that one of the reasons to bear testimony is not just in defense, if you're not sure what to do, but in offense to uh, cause people to be swayed by uh, the passion that mm-hmm. you're offering. You know, Doc, you know, something I meant to do earlier, and I just completely forgot and I need to do now is that I'm going to be telling people how they can donate to Deeper Waters later on the show mm-hmm. with when Dr. Wilder is on. But um, do you have an organization you would like to see people donate to while you're here? Yeah, thank you, Nick. I appreciate that. And, and uh, good. People donate to Deeper Waters. It's a good idea. So mm-hmm. Ratio Christi uh, looks like Ratio Christ mm-hmm. with an I. RatioChristi.org. That's the organization. There's a donate tab there. And uh, we just passed our seven year itch as a new 501c3 organization. Um, and uh, we're still the young young kid on the block in terms of campus ministries. And we don't have the that deep 
alumni pocket as you know campus crusade or university so anyone that uh, uh, wishes to help our cause to uh, help reclaim the universities for Christ. Please jump on board, not only with that, but if you have volunteer time, if you want to uh, take a chapter at a university, there are you know, thousands of universities, and we're only on 185 of them. Uh, if you want to work with high school students, if you want to reach college professors, we have an RC college prop or a college prep ministry, a professor ministry, the university ministry, and so forth. So lots of ways to help out if you're a retiree and you're thinking, what could I possibly do? Boy, we have so much uh, volunteer help needed too, uh, as far as even just data entry, uh, some tasks like that, so that our, our apologists and evangelists can stay on the campus. Apologetics.com. You know, I'll chance out a Mormon is listening to a show right now. What would you say to them? Well, you don't have to stop loving God if you reconsider not throwing the baby out with the bath water if Mormonism is false. Traditional Christianity is deep. It's deep waters. Mm. Uh, it's been time tested. And the sixth and final chapter in our book uh, addresses some of those concerns that you have uh, when you start doubting Mormonism. You also doubt, well, for the same reasons. What about the Bible and science? What about the problem of suffering? What about the rely historical reliability of the Bible. We address that stuff in the book as well, and that is for you. This book is written for Mormons, even though it's by a Christian publisher. Uh, we wrote it with Mormons in mind, so that any Christian who picks it up after they read it, please give it to a Mormon. Uh, you don't have to stop loving Jesus. The question you need to ask is this, I say to the Mormon, is Jesus enough? What could possibly tell you that there needs to be any more than Jesus. Jesus mm. is enough. His last words on the cross were, it is finished. That's not the message that Mormonism proclaims. I, I think your, uh, your co-ed or coming up next is very familiar with the idea of Jesus being enough, isn't she? <laughs> That's right. She is. <laughs> now, let's go into the Christian listening to this show here, who's engaging with Mormons who've seen these people are bicycling through, and I always get excited when I see the bicyclers in our apartment complex area. What would you say to a Christian listener today? I would say get our book. Um, it's got some helpful new material. Uh, we consider things even from the rhetorical standpoint. Uh, you know, evangelism is not just, and especially apologetics evangelism, is not just about being Spock on Star Trek. It's not just about logos, the rationality of truth. Uh, there is pathos and ethos to consider as well. Mm -hmm. uh, ethos is ethic or uh, competence or your trustworthiness. You need to be a trusted person. They, the Mormon needs to see that you love them and that you are interested in them and that two ears, one mouth idea can go a long ways. If you're asking lots of questions, Greg Kokel questions, uh, questioning evangelism questions, Socrates' questions, Socratic evangelism, uh, that goes a long ways to showing interest. It builds your ethos. And then pathos. Share your testimony with Mormons. This can be, at times, the most powerful witness to them because it speaks their language. Uh, in Christian apologetics, we are so used to everything resting on the Logos. Mm -hmm. But to the Mormon, they're interested in pathos and ethos, and sometimes the Logos. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to provide a community. It's about psychology, sociology. Does it work? Is there family there? Is it a loving community? Uh, that stuff is going to speak volumes to them about your proclamation of what is true. Mm -hmm. They need to be able to see it and feel it. 
Mm-hmm. Well, Dr. Mayor, I don't think we have enough time here to get into any more questions and such. When Dr. Wilder is on, I am going to share how they can purchase the book and such for a second hour. Um, do you have a, any uh, any uh, blog, uh, email, website where people can get in touch if they want to find out more? I would just go uh, to rachelchristie.org, find out more about our organization. If you want to contact me, uh, Corey Miller at rachelchristie.org. Okay. Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave for Deeper Waters audience? Uh, you know, Walter Martin once said, are you willing to do more for the truth than the cults are for a lie? Mm. They convert an average sized Baptist church per week just from the Baptist alone. They're not going away. One day we probably will have a uh, presidential uh, nominee and president from Mormonism. And at that time, it'll no longer have the cloak of cult and weird group. It'll be mainstreamed. Uh, it's growing even though there's an exodus. Mm -hmm. And uh, the two routes to avoid are the bash and dash routes. You don't just take your apologetic or your biggest Bible and bash them and say, victory, we've won. You want to win the soul, not just the argument. And second, you don't want to don your blinds or close your curtains or slam the door on them when they come to your door and say, I've got my religion, thank you. No, you should love them, truth and love, and you should, I would encourage you, if you're stable, call the Mormons, have the missionaries come visit you because it'll do two, three things. Number one, you can get a free Book of Mormon out of it. Um, you can uh, give it an opportunity to give the gospel to them. It'll take them off the field from converting other people. And it may end up resulting in their conversion too. Even if not right there in your living room, which they are trained not to give any sense of doubt. Uh, to the uh, prospective convert, they might doubt enough to leave Mormonism when they get home and cling to Christ. It's mm -hmm. happened on many occasions. Well, Dr. Mayor, I'd like to thank you for coming on. I do hope we'll see you back here again sometime. Thanks. It's been a real pleasure, Nick. It's uh, been a unique interview. I love it when they're when they're all different. This has been great. I'd like to let people know next week, we're going to have Rhonda stop on talking about marriage again. And the topic is her book, If My Husband Would Change, I'd Be Happy, and Other Myths Wives Believe. But now, we're going to get set because pretty soon, Dr. Lynn Wilder is going to be in here. Okay, now we're here for our second hour of the Deeper Waters podcast, and we've got the second co-editor, Dr. Lynn Wilder, here, talking about the book Leaving Mormonism and such. Now, Dr. Wilder, we didn't have time to get the academic bio and such, because it was kind of a, a last-minute change in many oh. ways, having you on here and such. But tell us a little bit about your academic history and then how you got to be doing what you're doing. Oh, actually, it started out with a spiritual experience, mm -hmm. Nick. Um, mm -hmm. In 1990, in the middle of Mormon territory, when I was LDS, I was awakened in the middle of the night. I felt like um, I needed to go back to school, which is kind of against what Mormon women should do, right? I needed to stay home and have lots of kids. I ended up with a doctorate, ended up getting hired at Brigham Young University. Um, I taught diversity and special ed, so my background's kind of working with everybody who fails in school, so kids in gangs, drugs, um, often uh, kids in poverty, minority kids, that kind of stuff. And at BYU, it's a, like a level two research university. So we, I had research teams and did a lot of publishing of uh, professional papers and then became a journal editor for a multicultural journal and uh, did that for probably a decade. So um, that's my background. And now I actually use my doctorates in emotional behavioral disorders, and I actually use it pretty much every day now, helping folks make the transition out of Mormonism to know Jesus. Very difficult for folks often transitioning out. It's very difficult for their Mormon families to accept and understand um, 
<laughs> there was just a suicide where we were in uh, Phoenix of a good friend of mine who left the Mormon Church about 10 years ago, really mm. struggling with some things. Yeah. Mm. Now, something we said when Dr. Mill was here is he was someone who was born into Mormonism, mm -hmm. but, you, but you weren't. No, my husband and I were looking for a church when we were about 24, and we'd been married three years, and the Mormon missionaries knocked on our door, Nick. Mm. I'd been raised Presbyterian, but I never opened my word. I could not have told you how how one gets reconciled to God. It was mm. a social thing, pretty much, for my family. Mm -hmm. Now, you uh, been pretty much found that it was easy pickings, as it were, for the Mormons to get you, right? Yeah, and I, Mike and I weren't so unusual in that way. According to a study done by the Pew Institute a few years ago, more than 80% of the people that join Mormonism, more than 80% of their converts, come right out of biblical Christianity. Mm. Um, folks who are probably nominal Christians and don't know anything about those false Christ, false prophet, um, false apostle, false teacher, um, false gospel sections, you know, in the New Testament that, mm -hmm. that warn about things like Mormonism. Mm -hmm. Now, so you and your husband joined the Mormon church, and it was actually your son who was a Mormon who helped get you out, wasn't it? <laughs> Yeah, God God puts together funny stories, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. our, um, all of our sons served Mormon missions, and when our third son went out, he was so zealous for the Mormon church that he uh, tried to convert Christian pastors to Mormonism, and his thinking was, if I can convert the pastor, then he'll assist me in converting the entire congregation to Mormonism. Mm -hmm. The first pastor that he challenged actually prayed over him and asked God to break the spirit of blindness over this young elder. Mm. About three months later, he encountered a Baptist pastor who then um, opened the New Testament, told him what the good news was, showed love to him, read Ephesians 2, 8, 9 to him, saved by grace, not by works, lest any man should um, boast, right? Mm -hmm. He said he'd never seen that. That really hit him. And then this pastor challenged him to read the Bible as a child with no preconceived notions, telling him that if he did that, he would find out what the true gospel was and that he believed that God would change his life and he'd never be the same. That did come to pass, and it came to pass right at the end of his Mormon mission where he realized Mormonism did not line up with the Bible, and so he chose the biblical God one day. And he actually got sent home from his Mormon mission in disgrace for mm -hmm. professing that Jesus was enough. Mm -hmm. Now, all of this, I should point out, is uh, in a book that we interviewed you on earlier, in, back in 2014, Unveiling Grace. And people, if you haven't read this book and you're interested in Mormonism, get a hold of this book as well. It is an excellent book, and I mean, I've forgotten a lot of the names and such. <laughs> times. Oh, she, she's showing it right now. You, you're not going to be able to see it here because we don't have video, unfortunately. Oh, but, we don't. Yeah. But it, it is an excellent book, and as we're at the end of the book, I feel like I knew your family just as well. And I, yeah. I think it's worth pointing out also that right after, do you remember who was the guest for next week after you were on? I, I don't. Who? Um, a group of ex-Mormon missionaries. I believe they do some oh. music as well. Do you know who I'm talking about? Oh, yeah, my kids. Actually, Micah... When he left his mission, mm. I, I honestly do not know what kind of uh, an mm. encounter he had with God when he gave his life to Jesus. But when he left his mission, when he got sent home in disgrace um, for no longer believing Mormonism, he um, challenged his 
challenged us to read the Bible, but he also told us he wanted to have a ministry back to Mormons, right? And as a Mormon, I didn't know what a ministry was. I I remember asking him, are you going to start your own church? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. so, so for the last, I think, 11, maybe 12 years now, Micah and his older brother, Matt, mm-hmm. And um, my son-in-law, Joseph, all former Mormon missionaries, and now they also have um, a young woman out of polygamy that travels Mm. and sings with them. So they do music, and then they tell their testimonies out of Mormonism. And that young woman is out of the LeBaron uh, polygamy colony in Mexico. She, let's see, five moms in that family, 30-some children, and her salvation is quite a miracle, right? That's a whole nother group of folks, maybe 100,000 of them in the Intermountain West alone, folks who are living polygamy, original Mormonism, Mm -hmm. um, that don't know Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, geez, this is very surprising me, Dr. Wilder, because... I thought polygamy was dead in the Mormon church. Are you telling me it isn't? (laughs) Well, (laughs) I can give you a little history because this is in the new book, Leading Mormonism. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, My husband really struggled with the idea of polygamy in the Doctrine and Covenants 132, of course, in Mormonism. A righteous Mormon man is supposed to have more than one wife in Mm -hmm. the next life. So polygamy is an eternal principle in Mormonism. That was uh, quite an issue for us. But after I left the Mormon Church, I started uh, digging into some of the polygamy history. And this is what happened. Abraham Lincoln actually disliked the Mormons for two reasons. One, they were a slave territory out in Utah at the time. Mm -hmm. And the second was they were practicing polygamy, and he was a strong Christian and felt like that was immoral. So in 1862, President Lincoln had the legislature pass an anti-bigamy or anti-polygamy law. And then, of course, Lincoln was killed at the end of the Civil War in 64, I believe. Um, And so Mormons continue to practice polygamy, kind of, you know, unhassled for a while. And then in the 1880s, Ulysses S. Grant, former general, right, from the Civil War, becomes president of the United States, passes an even stronger anti-bigamy law, and then marches the U.S. Army out Mm. to Utah and says, you will stop practicing polygamy. You'll never get statehood as long as you're doing this immorality, right? Um, Marches the army out there and says, we're going to take the assets away from the church if you don't stop practicing polygamy. Well, that drove the polygamists either underground or they ran to Canada or Mexico. And those polygamy colonies in Canada and Mexico that serviced in the 1880s are still in Canada and Mm -hmm. Mexico. Oh, and during the last election, you may have heard Mitt Romney say, oh, my father, my grandfather was born in Mexico. Well, he was born in a polygamy colony mm. because that is Mitt Romney's um, heritage is polygamy. Um, so, yes, all Pretty much all of the Mormon, uh, the uh, polygamy in the United States comes from original Mormonism. There might be a few Muslims practicing polygamy in the U.S. There might be some Africans, but certainly that's a small percentage. But um, estimates are somewhere between 30,000 and maybe 100,000 just in the Intermountain West in the United States still practicing polygamy. Mm. Now, your chapter also is on mental health and Mormonism. And as you know, mental health is something very personal to my wife and I. We're both on the spectrum of autism. And there's a whole lot of discussion going on of mental health after the Parkland shooting in Florida and such. So what are we talking about when we talk about mental health and Mormonism? Well, let's go back to polygamy, for example. Mm. I got to thinking about 
what are the social consequences for a man of believing that he will have several wives in the next life? The reason my brain went to that kind of thinking was as we were helping people out of Mormonism, I was running into people who had been sexually abused, Mm -hmm. lots of people who had been sexually abused, leaving Mormonism, right? And deciding whether they could find this biblical Christ. Well, some of that abuse was ritual sexual abuse. Some Mm -hmm. of it was occult abuse, and it involved involved, um, you know, leaders in the church, which was quite disturbing to me. I I wasn't aware of any of that, right, when I was in Mormonism. And certainly since 1890, the Mormon prophet had a revelation after the army got marched out and they don't practice anymore. Very convenient, wasn't it? (laughs) Well, you know, I don't know. Um, So, So, yes, but actually, um, there was a prophet that practiced polygamy uh, um, into the 1940s, actually. Mm -hmm. So, you know, polygamy has been a part of Mormonism in the United States. But what would be the social consequences? Well, I started looking into statistics Mm -hmm. and— Utah is the number one state in the nation for men who look at porn on the Internet. Mm. And then I'm thinking, does that have something to do with that teaching, right? The whole idea that I can have more than one woman. Um, And the rape rate is very high in Utah, according to um, national statistics. The other real surprise I found is among The prison population nationwide, the prison population is about 10 to 12 percent pedophiles. In Utah, the stats I found, they were almost a third. Almost Mm. a third of the prison population was pedophiles. Mm. So um, and then I also started learning that there really were some things in Mormonism's history, like in 1990, the church itself put out something called the Glenn Pace Memo that admitted that they knew they were having problems with people practicing the occult and doing some ritualistic things. Um, So that's one of the things I do address in the book. One of the other things I address is racism, which Mm -hmm. I also address in the book Unveiling Grace, because I taught diversity at BYU, Mm -hmm. and my students at BYU started telling me there was something called the curse of Cain, and that folks with dark skin were cursed. Um, Of course, it never says that in the Bible, but it's in Mormon scriptures, um, so that's a, the social consequences of believing that dark skin is less than white. Um, mm. Those have some certainly negative social consequences of mm. racism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so because I'm a social scientist, Corey and I decided to kind of have each of the people who contributed to this book, look at Mormonism from their own academic perspective. And so to me, there are a lot of reasons why Mormonism is not a mentally healthy place to be. Certainly another reason is that in Mormonism, you need to become perfect, right, in Mm. order for God's grace to kick in for you. Mm -hmm. Um, That's a horrific burden for people to never know if they have eternal life until the end of their life when they lay their works before Jesus. And if it's been enough, then maybe they'll be saved. Exactly what Islam teaches, right? Mm. Yeah, there's a, a lot of eerie similarities between Islam and Mormonism. Many, 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 many. And I've learned these because we've had a couple of Muslim converts by Mm. reading the book Unveiling Grace, realizing that workspace faith is a false faith, right? And that 
only by the grace of our Lord Jesus are you saved? Mm -hmm. And is that a gift? And that's the only one religion that's different, right? Your allegiance is to Jesus. He did it all for you. Mm -hmm. Um, so these, the one Muslim convert from the book Unveiling Grace had actually been on the Hajj, had been to Mecca probably nine times in his life. And so he was quite familiar with um, all of that. Plus, his father had been an imam in the Middle East. And so he was quite familiar with doctrine. So certainly in Islam, you have another angel that brings another gospel. Well, if you look at the experience that Joseph Smith had with that other angel, that angel of light that came and brought him the gospel, in uh, Mormonism's case, it was Moroni, it says that at first, Joseph Smith felt like he was doomed to destruction. In other words, he was having a demonic experience. He thought he was going to die. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden he sees supposedly the father and the son standing in light, right? Right. So, but Gabriel comes to Muhammad in the cave. He has a similar, really scary experience, goes home and tells his wife he thinks he's had a demonic encounter. And she says, no, no, it was God, right? Mm -hmm. So many similarities. Starts out as an Abrahamic faith, but then, it, oh, that's not quite right. And so we have to add to that. We have to have additional scripture. So then you have the Quran, you have the Book of Mormon. And besides the Book of Mormon, you eventually get the Pearl of Great Price and the Doctrine and Covenants. Um, it becomes a workspace faith in both cases, right? Where salvation is not, an, you're not assured of salvation. You never know if you die today, if you, if you live with God. That's uh, another similarity. Some of the similarities that surprised me between the two faiths were, okay, in the Mormon temple, the first time you go through the temple, Mike and I worked 10 years in the Mormon temple. The first time you go through, you go through and do all these temple ordinances for your mm. own salvation. The second time you go through, you go through in proxy for someone who's dead. Mm. The third time you go through in proxy for someone that's dead. So you only go through once for yourself. And then every time you go back, you're trying to save the dead. Mm -hmm. after you're dead. Well, <laughs> five pillars of Islam. One is sometime during your lifetime, you're supposed to make a pilgrimage to Mecca. When you make a pilgrimage to Mecca, then um, there's this building. That you go on the Hajj, you go into this building, you wear white, Mormons wear white in the temple. You go in with your family. Mormons often go in with their family. You make certain covenants as a Muslim in the Hajj. In the Mormon temple, you make certain covenants. And here's the one that blew me away. He told me, for example, if your grandmother dies and she was never able to make the pilgrimage to Mecca during her lifetime, then when she's dead... Someone who's a faithful Muslim can go to Mecca um, in proxy for her as if she had gone. Mm. Very similar to mm. what goes on in Mormon temples, right? We, mm. we do these ordinances for the dead because they have to have these ordinances done in order to be saved. And then, of course, um, both faiths require lots of good works, and then you never know till the end of your life whether you've done enough in order for God's grace to kick in and save you. That's the same between the two faiths. The other thing that I think is a real similarity is the um, reward of having a lot of women in heaven for men who are faithful, right? Mm -hmm. So if you and jihad, then you can have many virgins. And 
in Mormonism, um, if you're righteous, you can work your own way to become a god, have a world of your own, and have many wives. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone at this point, you're listening to a Deeper Waters podcast, and what we do is supported by listeners just like you. Ordinary people who decide they want to take part in this ministry here. So, I encourage you, please consider going to our website, deeperwatersapologetics.com. Clicking the link on the side helps support the work of Deeper Waters Christian Ministries. You click that link, and it takes you to the ministry of Risen Jesus. You've gone to the right place. That's the ministry of my in-laws, Mike and Debbie Lacona. You make your donation. You get in touch with Mike or Debbie or me or Al. You say, hey, I want to make my donation. I want to go to Nick Peters. I want to go to Deeper Waters. And they will make sure we get that donation and it will be tax deductible. You can also go online and buy uh, books on Amazon, ebooks that I've written, such as A Creed for the Ages, The Apostles' Creed in Today's Christian, or ones that I've co written, such as Defining Inerrancy, or God and Natural Disasters, or Groundless, any, any number of ones there. I, I, I can't always remember them all. And on top of that, well, we've got a lady here who can back me on this. Women love jewelry. I mean, do you love jewelry, Dr. Wilder? <laughs> well, I'm actually more of a tomboy, but yes, I, I do wear earrings, mm-hmm. and, and I have a cross that I always wear around my mm-hmm. neck. Well, we have a partnership with a lady who does jewelry for Premier Jewelers, which is a Christian jeweler, and she has a vet. You can buy something from her for us, and I'll help you all find out how to do that. If you need some help with it, just ask me. And whatever you buy, 25% of your purchase, whatever you pay, 25% will go to Deeper Waters. And... Guys, this is a great way to get in with the ladies in your lives. I mean, Dr. Wilder, he was talking about wearing a cross. I'm pretty sure they sell crosses there. They do sell earrings there. So, guys, what I'd like to tell you is this is, you can buy something special that lady in your life to make up for that big screw-up that you recently did with her. Or you can buy something special that lady in your life to make up for that big screw-up that I know you're going to make with her. <laughs> Well, Mother's Day is coming up. Yes, too. yes, Mother's Day. <laughs> Buy something for your mother. Now, um, if you can't do any of these, please consider going on iTunes and leaving a positive review for a Deeper Waters podcast. Y'all don't know how much it means to me when I see those. It's awesome. Uh, Dr. Wilder, do you have an organization that you'd like to see people donate to? Our website is unveilingmormonism.com, mm. and I, our organization is Ex Mormon Christians United for Jesus. That would be just lovely. Thank you. Mm. I'm kind of curious was the name unveilinggrace.com already taken, or did you just decide to go with that one instead? You know, the Unveiling Grace actually came from the gentleman who did the documentary um, Mm -hmm. of our story out, Unveiling Grace, Mm -hmm. and then Zondervan picked up the same title for the book. So it's not originally ours. Mm And yes, he already had the website. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Wilder, you're talking about all these damages that come from people being involved in Mormonism and such, where in... The book leaving Mormonism, you all do talk about the new atheists, and the new atheists would look at this and say, Hey, you know what? You're partially right there, but it's not Mormonism, it's all religion. This is the same thing across the board. Religion is either a sign of mental illness or it leads to mental illness. And what do you say? Is it just Mormonism that's a problem, or is it all of religion that's a problem? Well, I would say most religion is a problem, but Faith in Jesus Christ is distinguished from all other religions because of what Jesus did for us and because he's the only prophet or head of any religion (laughs) that's ever been or ever will be that rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. That is not anything a man can do. That's not anything a prophet can do. And I prefer to follow someone who has that kind of power and is that kind of large God. Mm-hmm. You, you know, the other thing I'll tell I'll tell folks, 
This is the sadness of folks leaving Mormonism that go to new atheism. And that is, first of all, the Mormon church teaches them, if we're not true, nothing's true. Well, that's a logical in fa- that's a logical fallacy, right? Mm-hmm. There aren't only two options, Mormonism or nothing. Mm-hmm. There are lots of options. Yep. So I say to people, search it out, look at it. And what if there was an option where you could actually use your brain? What mm-hmm. if there was a God that said something like Isaiah 1-1, come, let us reason together. What if there was a God who made the evidence for his word overwhelming? with something like 25,000 archaeological digs. Mm -hmm. You know, the Mormon church does not have any archaeological digs. They don't have any maps. They don't have anything that proves that the people, places, and events in the Book of Mormon happened. And yet the Bible has overwhelming evidence. Mm -hmm. Yet, when you're Mormon, you're taught the Bible's not reliable, but the Book of Mormon is perfect. So... The beauty of leaving Mormonism is you can open your mind and you can use your reasoning brain and you can compare different faiths. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you there is not another faith that compares to the biblical Jesus. There is no... There is no one else that raised from the dead. There is no other faith that has the overwhelming evidence. 25,000 archaeological digs, fulfilled prophecies, right? There are 11 prophecies still in Mormon scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants that never came true, that Joseph Smith prophesied, that cannot come true because those folks are dead. Um, The Bible doesn't have those kind of errors, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was blown away. Plus, we have manuscripts and lots of them, right, that take us pretty close often to the original time period. Um, All we have for the Book of Mormon is supposedly some gold plates that appeared oh, how many hundreds of years, 1,600 years after supposedly the Book of Mormon people died, one manuscript, and it's gone to heaven, Mm -hmm. you know? And yet, um, in biblical faith, we have 25,000 pieces of manuscripts in all, in all the Middle Eastern languages, right, parts of manuscripts, more than 8,500 of the New Testament in just Greek alone. So um, I read recently that, that if you're looking at a certain passage and the Mormon church would say it's mistranslated, we might actually have 800 surviving passages. If someone put a jot or tittle out of place, we can tell where that happened. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the things that just overwhelmed me when I read the Bible was, wow, the message is clear. It repeats over and over. It doesn't contradict itself. Um, And the the message of both justice and mercy are from the Old Testament to the end of the New. Mm -hmm. This God is consistent. He's smart. He's put it all together. He's kept it all together. And, of course, we have 66 books, 40 authors, again, over— 1500 years or more, right? And and the whole message fits together. And that's quite a miracle, really. No mm-hmm. other has that. Mm-hmm. And now something else I think you said in the book is that conditions like depression and anxiety are also very high in Utah, aren't they? And suicide rates, mm-hmm. yes. Mm-hmm. Part of that might be LGBTQ um, teens who have been outcast by the church, right? Mm -hmm. Um, That's caused quite a stir. The church decided a couple years ago they wouldn't even baptize the children of LGBTQ parents. And so um, that kind of cadre has all kind of left the church and gotten mad back 
to the church. Um, and we often have helped people out then who feel like they have gay or lesbian, um, you know, interests and wonder if they fit in Christianity somewhere. So these are important contemporary issues in Mormonism, um, as well as other faiths. Mm-hmm. Now, do you think that there could be, in fact, an increase of these things? Is it just Mormons in Utah, or is it Mormons outside of Utah that are also struggling with these things? It's worldwide. Yeah. Actually, in, oh, I must have been about 2006, maybe, mm-hmm. 2005 or six in Sweden, one of the general authorities in the Mormon church began to question his faith, Hans mm-hmm. Madsen, and his um, questions about his testimony of Mormonism ended up on the I don't know if it was a front page, but it ended up in the New York Times, must have been July of 2013, just a month before our second book, Unveiling Grace, came out. Um, So you could see that God has been at work in Mormonism. Many people are flooding out, and not everyone's finding biblical faith. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, the internet is being very disastrous to cult groups and such because there are so many things that have been tried to be kept hidden and such. Not really the case of Christianity. It's not like there's one big organization that's been doing a huge cover-up of everything. Although some atheists will contend that that's happening, but with Mormonism, everything is right out there in the open now, isn't it? It is, and... You know, unfortunately, Christians have never told Mormons <laughs> that their brand of Christianity is quite far off of traditional Christianity, right? Mm. That their brand of Christianity isn't even in the body of Christ. Yeah. That their God really is another God, another mm. Jesus. And mm. because they don't know that, they think they have the same one as traditional Christians. When they're done with Mormonism, when they decide their God is impotent, they assume you have the same one. So it's quite a message for Christians to be bold in their witness and to tell who their God is how much evidence there is for his word, um, how consistent his message is, how he actually rose from the dead, what he's capable of doing, how he answers prayers. And um, those were all new things to me as a Mormon. I didn't know there was a God that could do all those things. Mm -hmm. You know, the very first person, Nick, that read the book, Unveiling Grace, and called me up, my phone number's in the back of the book, and some people figured that out, um, had left the Mormon church in his 20s. He'd raised his children atheist for and now he was in his 40s, and someone gave him this book, Unveiling Grace. He read the book, called me up, and this is what he said to me. If there's a God that can do the stuff that you describe in that book, Mm -hmm. I'd be willing to give him a try. Mm. People don't know what our God is is capable of, Nick. How did that story turn out? Well, I knew a Christian in D.C. that was meeting with him for coffee for a while, Mm. and I don't know how it turned out. I often don't know how these things turn out. You know, in ministry, sometimes it's uh, one conversation, sometimes it's ten, sometimes it's two years intense. Um, Sometimes, you know, Christians are just planting a seed, someone else is watering and uh, that's the way it goes. You know, there's a point saying that, that that's an incredible story. I had no idea if it was a Christian in D.C. <laughs> <laughs> now that's funny, Nick. <laughs> I'm sure there are a few. <laughs> yeah. Now, what is it then that uh, do you think really leads to all this mental health issues that's inherent in Mormonism? We've talked about polygamy and such, and I think you also think perfectionism is something involved with that too, right? Huge, yes. I think that's a huge issue in Mm -hmm. Mormonism. The idea 
that you have to do so many right things in order to be reconciled to God. So in Mormonism, we always, when I talk to a Mormon about salvation, I always use the term eternal life because their eternal life requires someone going to the temple, continuing to go to the temple, being righteous enough to have a temple recommend, and then hoping they've done enough at the end of their life, they might be able to live with Heavenly Father. The Mm -hmm. only way you get to live with God the Father and go to the highest heaven is to be temple worthy. And in order to be temple worthy, you have to pay tithing, you have to hold a calling, you have to attend your meetings, you have to live a health code called the word of wisdom, no coffee, tea, alcohol, uh, tobacco. There are all these rules and regs. I used to get up in the morning and I'd have this long list of things to do, right? And I would be so upset if something happened, (laughs) some emergency happened to throw me off my list Mm -hmm. because I felt like my salvation was my responsibility, my Mm -hmm. exaltation, they call it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Now... I follow the God of the Bible, and he says in the Bible, you're you're to rest in him. It's a very different life. I don't go to bed with my mind running now all the time like it did in Mormonism. I totally trust God. I get up in the morning. I re-surrender my life to him. I recognize that, you know— um, my breath comes from him and then he brings things into my life. I don't have to create things necessarily. Um, very different way to live, trusting him wholly. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm curious, have you come across anyone in the Mormon community who, I mean, like I said, my wife and I have Asperger's, so we already have mental illness of some kind. Someone who's already has some pre-existing condition like that and then gets Mormonism on top of that. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's difficult. Mormonism's difficult, and then to add something like that is hard. Although I can tell you, if you have a serious mental illness, like, um, or a serious disability in Mormonism, and you cannot function at the mental age of eight, they believe that God brought you to earth to test other people. Mm -hmm. Your job is not to be tested, but to test other people. But if you do have a mental age of eight, And then you have other issues, like maybe you have cancer, or Mm. maybe you have depression, or maybe you struggle with LGBTQ tendencies, those kind of things. Those are all considered very serious sins in Mm -hmm. Mormonism. Mm. Um, So it's very, oh, it's quite difficult. Like I told you, we recently had a suicide. The suicide rate, too, is high in Mormonism, and I'm sure it has to do with people that feel like they just can't measure up. Mm -hmm. Now, I've heard stories also of uh, someone who did some work with someone to get them out of a Mormon church, which they succeeded in doing, and then later on, someone asked them, did you you know that guy that you got out of Mormon church? Yeah, you know what happened to him? What? Uh, He left, he got a plane ticket, he went to New York, and he hung himself. Mm. And I'm guessing that story, something like that probably isn't too uncommon, is it? Well, um, I would say that happens maybe more inside the Mm. church, and certainly less likely to happen with someone who finds Christ, Mm -hmm. who finds hope who finds forgiveness, Mm -hmm. who, who learns to forgive and can move ahead in their lives. I Mm -hmm. mean, here's what happens to a lot of people that leave Mormonism. They're angry, you Mm -hmm. know, through these stages, like Kubler-Ross's stages of grief, Mm -hmm. where you're shocked to learn what you first learn. 
then you're in a denial stage. You don't want to hear it. Then you get angry. And some folks stick in that anger stage for a long time, Mm. especially if they go to the new atheism. Oh, my goodness. They can hit against the Mormon church for years. Mm -hmm. I think when you come to know Jesus and you learn things like mercy and forgiveness and you feel forgiven yourself, can you kind of move forward in this mentally healthy way? Here's another thing, you know, family relationships are so upturned when people will leave Mormonism often. And sometimes families completely reject the person who's left. Um, I've heard incidents where people weren't allowed in their parents' home anymore, right? Mm -hmm. And that causes a whole set of um, emotional problems. But here's what I try to tell new Christians. Your God is so big. He's a healer. He's merciful. He knows your issues. Mm -hmm. He's able to bring emotionally healthy relationships into your life that aren't necessarily biological. Mm -hmm. But people in the body of Christ that have the same value framework and the same knowledge that you have from the scriptures that can walk with you, pray with you, help you along the way. And in many ways, you'll find that's much more emotionally and mentally healthy eventually, although that transition, which can last sometimes years from Mormonism to strong Christian faith, can be really challenging. I think a lot of people really have a hard time understanding the social aspects of Mormonism or any other cult for that matter, that when you are asked to leave Mormonism, I mean, if I was asked to leave my church and such, well, we just go down the street and we find another church. Right. With Mormonism, you can't exactly do that, can you? No, in fact, Latane Scott, who's a Christian author who also left Mormonism, and I are working on a book right now, which will be a guide for Christians who are mentoring Mormons Mm -hmm. to Christ to help them know how difficult it is, how long it lasts, what kind of issues they're going to need to Mm -hmm. address, how long they're going to need to walk with them, Mm -hmm. that it is a lifelong commitment of relationship, right? Mm -hmm help someone love Christ. Yeah. And by the way, I should point out, Latane Scott is one of the four authors in this book as well. Vince Eckers being the last one. And we'd be glad to have you and Latane on here when you're done with your book to discuss it. That would be a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so there is quite a need mm-hmm. among ministries that work with Mormons coming out for mm-hmm. some good materials. I've thought we really, really need a Bible study that helps folks sort, you know, truth from error according to the Bible. Adams wrote one of the most useful things they ever put together is a Bible topic guide, and it's on their website, Mm adamsroadministry.com, under their resources. Mm -hmm. And what they did was go through 40 topics that are taught by Mormonism, things like there was a great apostasy, you ha- you need to go to a temple, um, you need to hold the priesthood because you need authority, um, what is a Melchizedek priesthood, all these things that Mormonism teaches, and they went through and put all the Bible verses that teach the truth on that particular topic. Mm-hmm. And I use that guide every day. So if somebody's struggling with, is there a pre-existence or isn't? Well, let's look at these scriptures and see what God says about it, you know. So that's been really helpful to me. And often when we speak, we'll have the pastors run those off so that people actually have those. Yeah, one of the great concerns I have hearing what you're saying here is that you're talking about all these things that Mormons believe that are false, but... My concern is so many Christians, especially when it comes to questions like grace and such, their thinking could be extremely similar, or they don't know the differences and such, that they don't know enough about their own faith that they can talk to someone else about their faith. 
Well, it's not unusual for someone to come up to us after a presentation crying, saying that was the first time I ever understood grace or that, you know, you made it so simple that I, I now know what it is I believe. That, and and mm-hmm. <laughs> that's a wonderful thing as well. Pew Institute did a study quite recently and asked Christians if they believed that if they were saved by grace alone. Actually, the question was, can you get into heaven by faith in Jesus alone, or do you have to do good works in order to be allowed into heaven? Mm -hmm. And the majority of Christians said they had to do good works Mm -hmm. in order to be allowed into heaven. And certainly Catholics, um, 80 some percent of Catholics, 87, something like that, percent of Catholics uh, believed that they had to do good works in order to even be considered right to, mm-hmm. to get into heaven. But even among evangelical Christians, you'd be surprised that at least a third of them said, yes, we have mm-hmm. to do good works. Mm-hmm. Um, and see, isn't that what's supposed to separate biblical faith from every other faith, which is what you started out talking about in the beginning, right? Mm, Right. That Jesus is the one who did Mm. it all for us. He took our punishment. No other prophet or head of a religion did anything like that, nor Mm. did they die for us and then rise from the dead so that we might have life forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... I think you can definitely speak from experience because you were one of those Christians that didn't know enough about your faith at one time that you didn't recognize the the counterfeit when it showed up. Absolutely. So one of my favorite presentations that our ministry now does when we uh, are just talking to Christians is we will go through the entire New Testament and look at all the false Christ, false Mm -hmm. gospel, false apostle, you know, false teacher scriptures. And I'm amazed that Christians seem not ever to have seen them. They're not kind of familiar with them. They don't know who the false Christs are after. They don't have a sense that false Christs are folks trying to operate within the body of Christ. Why? Matthew 24, that they might lead even the elect astray, (laughs) right? So these are people, it's a counterfeit, trying to take people with a heart for Jesus and march them off in the wrong direction. Um, Islam doesn't claim to do that, nor does Hinduism or any of the other faiths. It is the most insidious thing to me are those who are trying to operate within the body of Christ. but are clearly not within the body of Christ because their doctrine is anti what Jesus himself taught. Mm -hmm. Now, we talk some about mental health some, and this has been in the news a lot since the Parkland Institute. And I sometimes think mental health can get a bad rap because it's too easy to jump to mental illness every time and blame everything on a mental illness as if if we just remove that all people are basically good and don't do wicked and evil things and such how should we really think about mental health today (laughs) well that's an interesting question mormonism does teach that all people are good people are born as children of god bible says the opposite right you Mm. become a child of god when you choose jesus then you're adopted in the bible says we're born in sin that this is a a broken world it's diseased and that happened when adam and eve chose the chose the wrong and so sin came into the world and so Mm. we live in this broken world. And only when we come to Jesus, right, is there hope. Um, And mental illness, oh, Oh, my Lord. I I could tell you stories and stories of kids that I had in class that I loved and loved and loved. And yet often their brokenness came from generational sins, generational brokenness. Sometimes I had kids from the inner city whose parents were doing drugs and um, they had been doing mm. drugs at a young age. Their parents would force them to have sex one way and another when they were very young, you know, and then the their lives 
are quite broken. And yet there are folks who have very normal upbringing, too, who struggle with things like schizophrenia, where they hear voices. Um, It is a broken world, and only in Jesus do we have hope. Let's picture, because it's going to be very rarely happening, but a Mormon is going through their through iTunes and they see this podcast and they decide to listen right now they're listening to this show what would you say to them? Oh, I would say I love you I know that you're taught that people that leave the church hate the church I have no qualms one way or the other with the church. What I have is a knowledge of a savior that is real, not false, who has changed my life profoundly. I pray that you will open your mind and your heart and use your brain in faith. You know, Mormons often cling to something called families forever. Well, wait a minute. In Mormonism, they teach that the righteous men are going to progress to godhood, have their own worlds. Well, wait a minute. If you have sons, they're going to be righteous and they're going to progress and have their own worlds. How is that family living together? It doesn't even make logical sense. So I would say to Mormons, there is a faith where you can engage your brain. Mm -hmm. There is a faith that's reasonable. There is a faith that's evidential. And there is a God who rose from the dead, who's real, who can rock your world. Mm -hmm. Um, Read the Bible and consider the true God. Mm -hmm. And what would you say to a Christian listening right now? Oh, please be in your word every day. Mm -hmm. Please know your faith and open your mouth. You know, (laughs) why are we afraid to tell people who our Jesus is? Didn't you have some kind of profound experience where there was a before and after where you knew that the Holy Spirit had changed you, where you were a new creation, where you had hope? Um. And if not, maybe you should question those things, right? Ask God about them. Ask God to open your eyes to things that are important. I've had some amazing, almost supernatural experiences that make me know that my God is real. Mm -hmm. I one Monday night prayed, God, open my eyes to who you're already working with within my sphere of influence that I might talk to them about faith, right? Mm -hmm. Don't Don't give me somebody that's not interested, so I'm hitting my head against the wall, but I'm happy to talk about Jesus. Tell me whose heart is already softened. I walk into work the next day. I walk down a hall, and a woman says to me, you, I dreamed about you last night, and invites me into her office. Mm -hmm. And this dream, literally, um, a voice was telling her, that she should be listening to what I say and following where I go. Mm. Now, I mean, that can only be God. So I was a new Christian. I didn't know how to evangelize somebody, but I started asking her, so do you know who Jesus is? Do you ever go to his church as a kid? You know, have you ever read the Bible? She looked at me and she said, 10 years ago, when I was in law school in Europe, I joined the Mormon church. Here we had someone who's an inactive Mormon (laughs) right right in the Bible belt in Florida Mm. that supernaturally connected me with. And we got her and my husband, I got her and her husband into the word, into a Bible study, into a Sunday school, eventually Um, They gave their lives to Jesus, got baptized in a church, and um, they're strong today. But God isn't on the move with his remnant. I almost feel like he's poured out his Holy Spirit over the Mormon people and is calling those who would seek him out 
Um, many we've talked to many Mormons who have found Jesus, and it it really is amazing little family we have this ex Mormon mm. now now Christian family. Well, Doctor Wow, well, I'd like to thank you for coming on again. It's been great to have you. And uh, do you have a blog, an email, a website, a way people can get in touch with you if they want to find out more? unveilingmormonism.com unveilingmormonism.com or you can find me on Facebook as Lynn Weeding Wilder thank you Nick we love what you do Um, I'm going to go read some of your books (laughs) Uh, do you have any foul message you'd like to leave for a deeper waters audience just um, that We do not dislike Mormons. We absolutely love Mormons and hope that they can find freedom in Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Wilder, it's been great to have you, and we do look forward to when we have you back on again, especially when you you get that new book done. Awesome. Okay, we'll do it. And hopefully people will read this book, Leaving yeah. Mormonism, Why Four Scholars Change Their Minds. Yes, I like to let everyone know, I just checked on Amazon. It's not on Kindle yet, apparently, but the paperback version is fourteen eighty five. And next week on the show, we're going to have Rhonda Stop on. She's the author of the book, If My Husband Would Change, I'd Be Happy, and Other Myths That <laughs> Wives Believe. So we're going to have another marriage episode. For now, I'm Nick Peters, and I'm signing off.